the first in the nation consumer protection standards for firearms. And we have the lowest gun death rate in the nation. We also have the lowest gun violence cost in the nation. We're a model for gun violence prevention. If every state in the nation simply had the same low gun death rate that Massachusetts has, over 27,000 lives could be saved a year. John, do you to start your video? Sorry. Sure. Yet, since 1994, we've experienced 40,000 gun deaths a year and over a million guns in America since we put up that billboard. Over the past three years, there's been a mass shooting of four or more people every single day. Since January 1st, there's been an average of two mass shootings a day of four or more people. That's in addition to the 100 people that will die today that woke up this morning from gun violence. 150 more will be injured. Many of those weapons that are used in the mass shootings and in the daily gun deaths are made right here in Massachusetts where they can't be sold or owned because of our effective gun laws and our permanent ban on assault weapons that Governor Romney signed into law in 2004, including copycat weapons. One of the weapons used at Columbine was made by Savage Arms in Springfield, Massachusetts. The AR-15 used in Aurora, Colorado was made in Massachusetts by Smith and Wesson. The AR-15 used at Parkland was made in Massachusetts by Smith and Wesson. Smith and Wesson weapons, AR-15 assault rifles and pistols have also been used at San Bernardino, Las Vegas, and more. And to remind everybody, Las Vegas, 558 people shot, 60 killed in a matter of minutes, and Congress did nothing, which is why it's so critical for Massachusetts to continue to lead the way. And by the way, we have enacted laws in Massachusetts in, in 1998, in 2004, in 2014, and 2018, three out of four of those gun laws were signed by, on a bipartisan basis, by Republican governors. This is not a partisan issue. This is not an effort to put anyone out of business. This is simply an effort to be consistent. If it's illegal to own assault weapons and sell assault weapons in Massachusetts, why is it okay for Massachusetts companies to make assault weapons, ship them elsewhere to cause mayhem across the country. So Congress has done nothing except for shrink under gun lobby money and pressure. Meanwhile, Massachusetts elected officials on a bipartisan basis have made our state, say our state the safest nation in America when it comes to preventing gun violence. But we can't turn our backs on every other state. In fact, we have the toughest gun laws in the nation, the lowest gun death rate in the nation, and perhaps Massachusetts, it's hard to know because there's not a lot of transparency and the gun industry is uniquely unregulated. Unlike toy guns and teddy bears, you cannot, you cannot put any regulations on the gun industry because of the National Consumer Product Safety Commission being barred from regulating the firearms industry, not the toy gun industry. So if you can't 
make, if you can't sell weapons here, why should they be made here to kill innocent Americans elsewhere? And that's why this morning we're holding a press conference. And it is my honor to, to introduce you to our lead sponsors, representatives Moran, Decker, and Senator Cream, as we have filed this morning the act to prevent mass shootings. And uh, I don't know how anyone can defend that it's okay to ban these weapons here, but make them and have them used elsewhere. And by the way, there's blowback because 70% of all guns traced to crime in Massachusetts come from out of state. So although they're banned here, they're not banned elsewhere. They're getting shipped elsewhere and they're ending back in Massachusetts in crimes. And with that, I'd love to introduce you to uh, Representative Moran um, representing Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. And do you guys mind if I do it in bilingual, in Spanish and English? I hope you don't mind. Great. Thanks, Frank. All right. Thank you. Buenos días y gracias por acompañarnos para aprender más sobre esta legislación de importancia crítica y cada vez más necesaria. Es una realidad lamentable que los tiroteos masivos se hayan convertido en una parte rutinaria de nuestra vida diaria como estadounidense. Estamos unidos de, no, de noticias sobre la pérdida de más y más vidas inocentes a causa de la violencia con armas de fuego sin sentido prevenible. Y desafortunadamente, muchas de estas tragedias tienen orígenes aliment alimentantes que aquí mismo en nuestro estado de Massachusetts nosotros la creamos. Actualmente, la ley de Massachusetts prohíbe la venta, transferencia y posesión de armas de estilo de asalto y dispositivos de alimentación de gran capacidad. También son uno de los estados con la menor cantidad de casos de muerte relacionadas con armas de fuego en los Estados Unidos. Sin embargo, lamentablemente, somos uno de los mayores exportadores de este mismo armamento de grado militar. Esto es simplemente inaceptable. Y es de suma urgencia que ampliemos la, la prohibición de armas de asalto de nuestro estado para incluir la fabricación de tales armas. Al hacerlo, protegemos a todos los estadounidenses de todos estos trágicos tiroteos masivos. Al mismo tiempo, nos aseguramos de que nuestros funcionarios encargados de hacer cumplir la ley no se vean expuestos a situaciones extremas que involucren estas armas de alta capacidad cuando hacen su trabajo. La semana pasada, aquí, en la ciudad de Lawrence, un lugar al que me enorgullece llamar mi hogar, hubo un incidente relacionado con un AR-15. Dos adolescentes irrumpieron en una casa equipada con estas armas y un cargador de gran capacidad para robarse simplemente unos zapatos. Es simplemente inaceptable que dos adolescentes hayan podido poner sus manos en una arma de este tipo y solo demuestra lo accesible que pueden llegar a estas armas si no tomamos medidas ahora. Diré esto sin rodeo, otra vez, diré esto sin rodeo, estas armas de estilo militar no tienen absolutamente ningún lugar en las calles de Estados Unidos. Y es por eso que hoy me enorgullece unirme a la representante Decker, al representante Whitbar Williams de Springfield, en la presentación de esta legislación que hace mucho tiempo, Massachusetts ha sido durante mucho tiempo un líder nacional en la prevención de violencia de armas. Y a través de esta legislación tenemos la oportunidad de ser mejores. Esta legislación salvará vida en Estados Unidos. Déjame decirlo de nuevo. Esta legislación salvará vida en todos Estados Unidos. I know you guys didn't understand it in Spanish, but I'll say it in English now. And thank you for allowing me to do this in Spanish. Good morning, and thank you for joining us to learn more. Oh, second. What happened here? Can you see me? Oh, we can't wrap Moran. Okay, I'm trying to I know what happened here with the video. All right.
Hey, somebody shut okay, me up. Frank, but we can hear you. Somebody shut me up for some reason. No, we can hear you, Frank. You can't? We can't okay. see you, but we can hear you. Yeah, somehow this video shut off. Don't know why. All right. I don't know what happened. But I'll continue. But I'll say it in English. Sorry about that. Somebody shut me up for some reason. Good morning. And thank you for joining us to learn more about this critically important and increasingly necessary piece of legislation. It is an unfortunate reality that mass shootings have become a routine part of our daily lives as Americans. We are inundating with news stories of more and more innocent lives being lost to senseless, preventable gun violence. And unfortunately, many of these tragedies have startling urgence right here in the state of Massachusetts. Currently, Massachusetts law prohibits the sale, transfer, and possession of assault style weapons and large capacity feeding devices. We are also one of the states with the fewest instances of gun related death in the United States. However, we are unfortunately one of the largest exporters of this very same similar grade weapons. This is simply unacceptable. And it is of the utmost urgency that we extend our state's assault weapon bans to include manufacturing of such weapons. In doing so, we will protect all Americans from yet another tragic mass shooting, while also ensuring that our law enforcement officials are not put into extreme situations involving these high capacity weapons in the line of duty. Just last week, here in the city of Lawrence, a place that I'm proud to call my home, there was an incident involving an AR-15. Two teenagers broke into a home equipped with this weapon and a high capacity magazine attempting to steal a pair of sneakers. It is simply unacceptable that two teenagers were able to get their hands on such a weapon and only goes to show how accessible these weapons can become if we, do, if we do not take action now. I will say this bluntly, this military, this military style of weapons have absolutely no place on the streets of America. And this is why today I'm proud to join Representative Decker, Representative Bud Williams in filing this legislation that is long, long overdue. Massachusetts has long been a national leader in gun violence prevention. And throughout this legislation, we have an opportunity to be better. This legislation will save lives throughout the United States. Let me say it again. This legislation will save lives throughout the United States. And I wanna thank you all for, uh, for your attention to this important matter. Thank you, everybody for listening. We have to do something. This is going to save lives all across America. Thank you. Thank you, Re Representative Moran. <clears throat> um, our other lead sponsor on the House side is uh, Marjorie Decker from Cambridge, who has been uh, a consistent leader uh, here in the, in the Commonwealth uh, working with us. And uh, it's an honor to um, introduce her to right now. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Representative Moran. And uh, thank you to my colleagues, Representative Williams and Senator Cream, who are on this call today as well. Today, I've joined my colleagues, Representative Moran and Senator Cindy Cream. As of 8.30 this morning, we filed an act to stop mass shootings. This bill is an acknowledgement that some of the safe protections that we have in Massachusetts due to our own common sense gun ownership laws that we want to extend some of those protections to people who live in other states across the country. In just one month, we've had 45 mass shootings. In just the last few days, we've had five mass shootings. These are choices that we make. Many of us take great pride in, in knowing that we have helped legislate common sense gun ownership policies that have ensured that Massachusetts has the lowest gun homicide rates in the nation. We don't allow these assault weapons of mass destruction to be manufactured in our state and sold to private citizens in our state. This bill will prohibit the making of these assault weapons for the purpose of selling to citizens, private citizens, civilians. 85% of the mass shootings that occur in this country have occurred with military style weapons. 
The purpose of these weapons, these military style assault weapons, they were originally designed for one purpose. As I said, assault weapons. When comparing the United States to 20 other, 29 other high-income countries across, across the globe who've lost children to gun homicide from the ages of zero to 14, the U.S. accounts for 93% of those deaths. This bill will provide an opportunity for us to help save lives across our nation. 58% of the citizens of our nation have experienced personal, have personal experience with gun violence. This is a choice. We have empirical data both here in Massachusetts and across the nation that shows us a clear path to stopping the killing of children, the slaughtering of people by reducing access to assault weapons to civilians and private citizens. If we no longer produce and manufacture military style assault weapons here in Massachusetts, and we impact the ability for private citizens, civilians to access these weapons, we know there will be fewer mass, mass shootings. We know less people will die. We must decide what we value more, the freedom to live without fear of being shot in a mass shooting or the freedom to allow the manufacture of military style, style weapons in our names in our state. We don't allow these assault weapons to be made and sold here in Massachusetts to private citizens. So why should we allow them to be made here and sold to private citizens across the nation? These are policy choices. There is no greater calling as an elected official than to seize the opportunity to save lives. I am so grateful to be joined by my colleagues here today, Representative Moran, Senator Cream, you know, we have Representative Bud Williams on this call. And today we invite our colleagues across the Commonwealth to join us, to join us in the opportunity to ensure that we can help save lives across the nation. Finally, we know that these weapons that have been manufactured here, these assault military style weapons that have been manufactured right here in Massachusetts have been used to kill and slaughter children and people across the nation. from Parkland to Aurora to San Bernardino to Las Vegas and many, many, too many other communities across this country. Today, I am joined by two families who have lost their children to manufactured assault weapons that were made here in Massachusetts and used to slaughter their children and their classmates and their teachers and their friends and their peers who are either in school or just watching a movie. I'm joined first by Sandy and Lonnie Phillips, who were the parents of Jessica Redfield Gawi. She was slaughtered with 11 other people in the Aurora, Colorado theater in 2012. They are the founders of Survivors Empowered, a national organization created by survivors for survivors. Empowering survivors. The organization provides support and referrals for services to, to survivors of violence, including connecting survivors to a support network of other survivors in their area, educating survivors on how to tell their stories in a compelling way to speak to the issue of violence in their communities, and staffing a, rap a rapid response team that is made up of veteran survivors of violence to respond to mass casualty events. Today, I thank Sandy and Lonnie Phillips for joining us and I continue to extend my condolences for the unnecessary grief that they carry with them today. Hello everyone, I'm Sandy Phillips and I'm the mother of Jessica Redfield Gowie, who was 24 at the time of her death. She was killed by an AR-15 that was made by Smith & Wesson in Massachusetts. 
my daughter was shot six times. And if you know anything about the AR-15 and the ammo that it uses, you know it was designed to do nothing but to kill as many people as possible in as short a time as possible. The killer was very successful. <clears throat> he killed 12, including my daughter, and wounded 70, all the while wearing tactical gear and playing music so he wouldn't hear the screaming of those he was killing and terrorizing. My daughter was first shot in the leg, making escape impossible. That bullet went on through her leg and into the other one. The young man that she was with was an EMT and he immediately started emergency response, not knowing how bad the wound was. She was hit three more times in the stomach, one more time in the shoulder that pulverized her shoulder blade, all the while screaming for someone to call 911, fighting for her life as best she could. And all of a sudden she was silent. Her friend looked over and realized <clears throat> that she had been shot in the head. That one shot alone left a five inch hole in my daughter's left orbital, blowing her eye away, blowing her brains out onto the theater floor, the seats and onto her friend who witnessed the whole thing. These weapons are made in your state, but they can't be sold in your state. So in effect, Massachusetts is exporting bloodshed to the rest of the country. We could beg Smith and Wesson to stop producing this weapon, but because of the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, they won't because they don't have to. There are no, no reasons um, other than the pleas of Americans for them to do anything to stop the carnage. Legislation is the only way. So we're very thankful to the representatives on this call today to try their best to get a law passed that will save other Americans in other states and stop the bloodshed. So I wanna speak a little bit about the, lethal the lethality of this weapon. So when our daughter was shot, it's been almost nine years ago now. It's still very fresh in my mind. I can picture her trying to hide behind those theater seats while those 223 bullets are ripping through the seats through each person there and continuing on to hit someone else. This gun was, I call it a gun. It's not a gun. It's a weapon. It's a firearm. It's a military weapon that was designed by the militaries of the world. Germany first designed it, the Stag 44. It was perfect. It was again, Russia built their own AK 47, and then America perfected it with the AR 15. The thing that most lethal about this weapon is the projectile that it shoots. It travels at a high velocity when it hits flesh and bone, it disintegrates and goes through other organs. It is uh, to be shot with one in the shoulder, it could very well kill you. Uh, so the fact that this weapon is sold so freely in this country uh, has nothing to do with mental health. It's the killing of this weapon and the availability of this weapon to our citizens is the cause of all the carnage in this country. The fact that, that we're trying to get this off the market right now is the only way in my mind will stop public mass shootings, which is someone walking into a theater, a school, um, any place for the public and kill as many people as they can with this weapon. We've got to do something about it now. Thank you, Massachusetts, for doing this. Thank you, Sandy and Lonnie, for, for sharing 
the continuously painful story of your daughter Jessica's death at the hands of an assault weapon that was manufactured right here in our state of Massachusetts. I'm now joined by Manny and Patricia Oliver, who are the parents of Joaquin Oliver, who was murdered in the Parkland shooting. They are committed to making sure that their son's life and the lives of 16 other victims are never forgotten and that real change happens to prevent future tragedies like this from ever happening again. Ever happening again. They found it changed the ref and memory of their son Joaquin and Joaquin, just like Jessica, died at the hands of an assault weapon that was manufactured right here in Massachusetts. Thank you, Manny and Patricia, for joining us. Thank you for having us here. Um, we are Patricia and Manuel. We are the parents of that handsome guy that you see in the huge billboard at the Prudential Center in Boston. Uh, so he's always been um, along with your fight supporting you guys. On February 14th, late at night, we were notified that Joaquin was one of the victims. Um, 17 people died, Joaquin was one of them. Uh, a few hours before that, we were running around the city from one hospital ER to another, trying to find Joaquin, hoping that he was injured in some place. A couple of hours before that, we knew that there was a shooting inside the school uh, I knew that because Patricia called me. There was an alert. There was an active shooter in the school. A few hours before that, I took Joaquin to the school that morning, gave him a kiss, and told him I love him. He said back, I love you, Dad, and I'll talk to you later. A day before that, a 19-year-old kid was putting together an AR-15 and ammunition so he could do so he could be part of a tragedy on Valentine's Day. A few days before that, that same kid went into a gun store and legally purchased an AR-15 with very minimal restrictions or maybe not. A few days or months before that, someone in Massachusetts was able to manufacture an AR-15. The person that was putting those pieces together in that factory knew that this was not a weapon to protect anyone. This was a weapon to attack and to kill people. In other words, the person who, who ensemble these pieces together, was able to sleep okay that night after creating a killing machine. And I like to go to the root of the problem. The killer of my son is a combination of situations. It's a combination of guilt. It's a combination of bad things. And, and, and it's so ironic that a state that has been so rigid with its gun laws and, and also has succeed when you compare the numbers, still has, uh, brings the opportunity to God's manufacture to put together these pieces and create killing machines. So we cannot wash our hands and pretend that we are not part of a problem if we keep on allowing this to happen. There is no reason, no reason for any civilian to own an AR-15. I assume you will never use that for any good cause. The moment you um, own an assault weapon, there's a high risk 
that something bad will happen. This is not about protecting yourself. This is not about protecting your family. This is about being ready for war. So we support 100% the fact that this cannot be produced in Massachusetts. Um, I believe that they might come up with an idea that um, moving to Florida might work. That wouldn't surprise me at all. But at least we will have um, a total sense in the actions that we have been taking in Massachusetts. So we are proud of being part of this group and, and we really hope that you get to the end of it. Well, thank you for these representatives that are with us today that are uh, sponsoring this important bill. As we have all heard before, what is the meaning of this bill? I just ask to promote for the media and to educate how important and what is the really issue here and what are we trying to protect with this bill and to be able to go through other states. We have to educate what is exactly what we're pretending to get through this in order to other people understand and support this bill all around the country. So thank you so much for giving us the time to share with you what we've been going through. And we as James Ref will be always working and pushing and supporting anything that will protect others to be going through what we've been going through. Thank you. Thank you, Manny and Patricia and Lonnie and Sandy. I don't know how you do it, um, but we will never stop doing whatever we can to help make sure this doesn't happen to others. And this, your work is not in vain because I don't know how anyone can wake up in the morning. We don't have the gene to bury our children and ever be the same. And uh, I'm just glad it was frankly, someone stronger than me like Marjorie Decker that could introduce you after Lonnie and Sandy. Um, and, you know, just briefly, you know, 900,000 people have died, you know, since we put up that billboard in the Mass Pike. A lot of people just like you. And I met me parents of dead children just like you every week for the last better part of 30 years. And it gets me every time. And I'm sure it got everybody else every time. But, you know, and, and I don't want to pile on, but I, and I am sorry. And I, you know, I, to say it this way, but it's true. I mean, when I met the parents, you know, of kids killed the 20, you know, first graders killed at Sandy Hook after receiving three to 11 rounds with an AR-15 military assault, assault rifle. And they had to identify their children by their clothing because they were indistinguishable looking. That is not a weapon for self-defense. That is a weapon of war. And when you combine that with a 30 or a 100 round magazine, remember police carry 13 to 17 in their service weapons. Congress gives anyone without a background check or an ID 35 to 100 round magazines. In fact, as a gun owner myself, I've hunted. And when I hunt, I gotta get a license. And when I get a license to hunt, I'm limited to three rounds for duck and five rounds for deer to protect the duck and deer population. And Congress does nothing to save human lives. In fact, there is no limit on the number of rounds you can carry to kill humans. So thank goodness for our Massachusetts legislators. And the leader in the Senate has been C Cynthia Cream, who has um, been there with us every step of the way and Cynthia, uh, love to have you say some words. Thank you, John. It's always so great to walk this path with you. You're such so passionate and, and so wonderful uh, on this issue. 
So I'm also proud to be working with this incredible group uh, to the speakers who have suffered firsthand the impact of losing a loved one to gun violence. I offer my gratitude and amazement for their strength that you show and continue to show in advocating for change. I met Manny and Patricia when that billboard went up and every day that I drive to work, I see their son and I know and feel their pain. While you have my sympathies and prayers, I, I do not offer these easily today because they will not lead to the changes we need to end the violence caused by these military style weapons. We often speak proudly of our tough gun laws in Massachusetts, including our ban on assault weapons. However, we cannot ignore the fact that assault weapons built in Massachusetts are being exported and used to murder our fellow citizens and law enforcement officers in other states. Maybe we never thought about it, or maybe we've closed our eyes, or maybe we're just selfish and we say, okay, you can't do it in Massachusetts, but you can do it elsewhere. And so I hope that it really was always a mistake and that we never intended when we passed that law for anybody to have access to these assault weapons other than military and government. These weapons increase the likelihood of multiple murders. They're designed for military use and do not belong in the hands of civilians. Now that we've banned them in Massachusetts, we need to go back and say, Maybe this was a loophole and we need to take the responsibility to reduce our gun violence by manufacturing, by banning their manufacture for individuals here in Massachusetts. I'm proud, so proud to stand with all of you. And every time I read of another shooting with an assault weapon, I say, why? Why aren't we doing something? So there's no time like now. I thank you, John, and so pleased to be with all of you. Thank you, Senator. You know, as they often say, all politics is local. And um, you know, we are gonna hear a lot of opposition to this bill because of jobs. Remember, 90% of all gun deaths today and every day are with handguns, many of which are made legally in Massachusetts. This is not an effort to ban handguns or ban anything other than military style weapons that aren't allowed to be sold in this state. Um, but I guarantee you, uh, there'll be a lot of misinformation. I don't think a lot of jobs are at stake here, uh, but I do think lives are at stake. And it takes a lot of coverage for a, a local rep from the city of Springfield to take this on. And it's an honor to, uh, rep to, to introduce you to Representative Bud Williams from the city of Springfield. Uh, thanks, thanks, John. And thank you for all the work that you do and to this uh, amazing panel and to the families who have lost loved ones. Um, we appreciate you. Hopefully, those lives uh, have not been lost in vain. And certainly, we're praying for you. Uh, this is just a real common sense approach. And I know that uh, Smith & Wesson is located uh, in my district. And um, I have always tried to work with Smith and Wesson, uh, realize there's jobs, the impact of jobs uh, in, in the city of Springfield and in Western Massachusetts. But this common sense approach that you can't own an assault weapon in Massachusetts, you can't buy it, but we can manufacture it. Um, Senator Crean, you were right spot on, a little bit of a loophole that we, we need to correct. Uh, I know the country uh, is sick and tired of being sick and tired because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. But it's as if we become immune to shootings uh, just the past week and days and months, countless thousands of lives being lost 
month in and month out. I think uh, Massachusetts, uh, we realize that, you know, the NRA is going to come charging at me and the Second uh, Amendment uh, right to have the right to bear arms. These assault weapons are meant for war. Plain and simple. And as uh, Representative Moran indicated, they're starting to get in the hands of young people all over the country. Uh, it's almost as easy to get a Big Mac or buy a Whopper as to get an assault weapon. Not that hard. And simply, we have a responsibility. Uh, when we see something that's not right, that's incorrect, we need to fix it. Uh, they're going to come charging gun right advocates. They're going to make that conversation about um, my right to bear arms and all that. That's the, the far from the truth. These assault weapons are meant plain and simple for war. Plain and simple. War, war, war. So I stand with this great bunch of legislators to push hard for this legislation. Let's stop the manufacture of guns in Massachusetts. We need to take a step, step up, step back, move forward. They're gonna come very hard. But as I said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I know families are. And to me, John, it seems as if it's getting worse, not better. Uh, there, there's no appetite to, to, to take on um, I guess the NRA and gun right advocates, uh, but I'm prepared to stand with this great panel, this great group, great bunch of legislators to stand, let's push this. And as I said, Smith & Wesson is located in my district. And um, assault weapons are meant for war. And if the military wants to use them, they can use them. But the average citizens, should not have the right to have an assault military style weapon where they can go to war on our citizens of this country and the Commonwealth at any time that they want, that they feel free to do. We have no control. So if there's no control, we don't have uh, the, the, the ability to pull things back. Responsible people have to stand up and do responsible things. So I think this, this group is responsible. I'm happy to be here, plan to stand with you, and uh, let, let's, let's get it done. Let's put the helmet on, let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, very much. Um, and we'll be standing with you too. And just to be 100% clear, as a gun owner and a business person, I can tell you this is, uh, this is within our rights as under the Second Amendment. Um, and as Justice Scalia wrote for the, the Supreme Court in the DC Heller case on the Second Amendment, you can't ban guns in the common use of the time of the founders. And he specifically said, I don't mean assault weapons. They didn't exist. And you can put reasonable restrictions on how guns are sold. That's what Massachusetts has done. That's what has made Massachusetts the safest state in the nation when it comes to gun violence. Um, California has done a very similar thing with banning the manufacture of uh, military style assault weapons. And um, as, uh, you know, as you've heard today, um, this is not about banning guns in Massachusetts. It's about banning the sale of, and, and manufacture of assault weapons that can't be sold here because of our assault weapon ban. Um, and they are absolutely, these are the weapons that are outgunning police. Um, and these are the weapons that are the choice of mass shooters. And Massachusetts can, can have an impact nationally uh, with this bill. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions. Hi, all. Can you? Uh, uh. Hi, so if anybody has a question, if you use a reaction function on the bottom of the screen and you raise your hand, we can unmute you. I think Chris Lazinski from the State House was trying to ask a question. 
Great. And I see Anthony is also here. And Anthony, I'm going to unmute. Can you unmute Anthony? Says he's unmuted. Uh -oh. It's his earphones. You can hear me now. How's that? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you for this. Uh, I'm not sure who this question goes to, maybe to John or, or, or Marjorie or, I, well, any one of the legislators. But I gather that there will be pushback in terms of jobs lost. Um, and John sort of addressed that. But I guess my specific question would be, what do you say to folks who say, well, Smith and Wesson will just shift to Connecticut or to another state or, you know, take take these Massachusetts based jobs and go to another state uh, to make their assault weapons if uh, military style assault weapons, if this law is passed. Marjorie, do you want me to take a stab at that? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Anthony, the majority of weapons. So there's at least 24 known gun manufacturers in Massachusetts. Um, Smith and Wesson, Savage, Springfield Arms. There's even one called MAGA, which may be, you know, make America great again, gun manufacturers. I don't know. Um, it's hard to know exactly uh, how many assault style weapons that uh, these various manufacturers make. And in fact, Smith and Wesson has a long history of making high quality guns. They, they, uh, they made a childproof gun back in 1904, uh, marketed it as childproof. Um, they never made military style assault weapons until the federal ban on assault weapons ended in 2004 and they were sold, bought by a group of Wall Street private equity guys uh, and, uh, and now they specialize in assault weapons. We don't know how many of the roughly 2000 jobs that they have out you know, and around the state uh, or in around the country are gonna be impacted. Um, but I would venture to guess that it's a relatively small number because the majority of guns they make are handguns. And I would also venture to guess that there's a whole lot of people that work at Smith & Wesson that would like to not have blood on their hands uh, making military style weapons designed to kill as many people as quickly as possible and outgun police officers. But we don't know that yet, Anthony. Great. Um, does Dehan from GBH News wanna ask their question? Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any specifics on the makes and models or the companies that would be affected? I know Smith & Wesson, but uh, I wasn't sure if something like Savage Arms would also be affected by this. I'm just looking for specifics um, on the, the models that would be affected and considered military style under uh, this legislation. Well, it's easy enough. Um, we don't know that yet. Um, if, if a gun manufacturer in Massachusetts doesn't make military style assault weapons, they've got nothing to worry about. Um, and, um, you know, we have the first in the nation consumer protection standards for firearms. So guns that are made in Massachusetts and sold in Massachusetts or ones that are sold in Massachusetts have to have minimum safety standards, for instance. So um, it's gonna be up to the gun manufacturers to uh, ultimately decide what's more important. Uh, you know, staying in Massachusetts where their kids are safer <laughs> or moving. And I don't think they're gonna move. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna impact that many people, but um, we don't know exactly because you can also, you know, make parts um, and, uh, and assemble them elsewhere. So it, it's a really hard question to answer. Can I add, can I add the fact that uh, we don't know uh, who's gonna be affected, but we do know who is not gonna be affected. And, and that is exactly what this is about. It's about saving lives and protecting people. Uh, so I, I would love to address the fact that I feel that we're more concerned about the final destiny of the manufacturer and not the final destiny of our kids and, and civilians in general. Thank you. Uh, Chris from State House News, did you have a question? I think you got cut off. 
Hi, yeah, thanks for, for calling on me. Um, I, um, I know you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but just to, to ask again for some more specifics, is there any real rough sense of um, how much business in Massachusetts is made up of manufacture of weapons and devices that are banned for sale here? Do we have any sort of rough ballpark number of just what percentage of um, you know, business manufacturers do that they then export elsewhere? Well, Chris, it's again, we don't know exactly, but we absolutely do know that Smith & Wesson has gone from a big part of the solution uh, to now having a whole lot of guns that, that they make that uh, you know, don't comply with the Massachusetts, both consumer protection standards and assault weapon ban. It didn't used to be that way, but since uh, the, uh, they sold to this new group, uh, American Outdoor, um, if you looked at their uh, website, um, you know, they're bragging now um, that they sold over 600,000 guns during the pandemic. Um, we don't know uh, exactly how many of those are weapons that are banned here in the state. Hey, Chris, it's Marjorie. Um, what, we, what we do know is that the military style assault weapons that they manufacture, we know that we've made a choice in the legislature to not allow them to be sold here. And so really the question is, why would we want them to be made here and sold elsewhere when we've just heard from two families, but they are two of, of many, many families who've lost children to guns, to assault guns. I wanna be very clear because I don't want my words to be misconstrued and purposefully um, by those who might have a um, stake in doing so, that they've made assault, military style assault weapons here that they could not sell here but they were able to say, sell to private citizens who then use them to murder people across the nation. So I think that's, that's really the question that this legislation is focused on. Thank you, Rep Decker. Erin, do you wanna ask a question? Erin Tiernan. Sure, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, um, I just kinda of wanted to build off Chris's question. Um, do we know how large of the market share nationally, Smith and Wesson and other Massachusetts manufacturers, um, how much the how much of those weapons from those manufacturers are on the national market? We do, we have a pretty good sense of it. The ATF issues a report. Smith and Wesson issues reports. Uh, in 2019, um, Smith and Wesson, our Massachusetts gun makers, made more guns than any other state in the nation, and Smith and Wesson was among the top. Uh, probably the largest. Um, also, if you look at the list of crime guns, I mean, it's why gun tracing is so important, but if you look at the list of crime guns here in the Commonwealth, you know, not only do we know that 70% of guns uh, traced to crime are originally sold in other states and brought here, um, Smith & Wesson handguns end up uh, in the top 10 list year after year after year. And it's largely because they make so many. Uh, you know, so they're high volume, uh, you know, gun maker. And as a result, those guns end up in crimes. Do we know if any other states have done legislation like this or is this the first in the nation? We know that California did a similar law. We don't know whether it's been upheld, you know, whether it's challenged or upheld. I mean, every law that we have here in Massachusetts, you know, has been challenged uh, almost, I believe every law, but um, you know, all of our laws. Remember, uh, Scalia wrote for the majority of the Supreme Court, you can put reasonable restrictions on, uh, restrictions on how guns are sold. We're the model for that. We're ground zero here in the state and our laws have been challenged and upheld. California's law, uh, as far as I know, has been, uh, I can't imagine it hasn't been challenged and it's been upheld. Um, so, um, you know, but often, you know, great public policy leads to great public health outcomes and Massachusetts is a leader for that. We owe it to the nation to continue that leadership. Great, Scott, Scott Lehigh, do you wanna ask a question? Scott. Uh, it sounds like, I think it sounds I like Scott, oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I want to ask this question. Do you guys know how many other states have an assault weapons ban? And would this be a, a sort of a public policy tool 
that that legislators or initiative petitioners could do in other states saying saying uh, th these weapons can't be cannot be um, manufactured here. I can I can take that really quickly. Um, so six other states in the U.S. have an assault weapons ban, and then an assault weapons manufacturing ban. Um, there are just three states: New Jersey, New York, and California that have an assault weapons manufacturing ban as a part of their assault weapons ban. And then the other states that uh, ban assault weapons, I believe, are Connecticut, Maryland, and Hawaii, um, as well as Massachusetts. And Scott, if you look at the top, uh, you know, the, the CDC issues, as you know, and you've done great reporting on this, as the CDC issues an annual report on the uh, gun death rates per state, you know, Massachusetts has the lowest gun death rate in the nation, followed by New York and New Jersey, both of whom have assault weapon bans as well. So, you know, the states with the toughest gun laws have proven that gun laws work. The states with the lax gun laws have proven that, you know, unrestricted access to guns adds to the level of death and injury from guns. Emma, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you to the families for being here and, and sharing your really difficult stories. Um, my question is for Representative Williams. You acknowledged as a person with a gun manufacturer in your district, the sort of strong pushback you anticipate from manufacturers. I'm wondering, have you spoken to other state lawmakers who have gun manufacturers in their districts? And are you optimistic about the political chances of this at the legislature? Uh, first of all, I think uh, we have uh, Salvage Arms in Westfield and Smith and Wesson in Springfield. And um, my, my position is um, to talk with Smith and Wesson and maybe they can come to an agreement. Maybe they'll just stop manufacturing. Uh, but I'm prepared for the fight. Uh, I know it's gonna come, but uh, as I said, I'm sick and tired being sick and tired. Assault weapons uh, have no place in the hands of uh, average citizens on the streets, too easy accessible. And when you do, when you do the tracing and you trace back to so many of the weapons were, were uh, manufactured at Smith and Wesson. That that's really troubling, and it troubles me. So we have to, um, you know, stand up for for, for for basically stand up for those who, who are voiceless, those who really can't do much about it, but 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 talk about it. We're going to do some legislation, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, we will prevail. Uh, go to the end, and uh, when you hear from these families, and you really have a sensitive ear? Uh, is it uh, lives over profit? And that's what it's about. You're talking lives over profit. And I think we all have a responsibility, including Smith and Wesson Salvage Arms, who are in, who are in uh, Massachusetts. We all have a responsibility to save lives, number one. Thank you. Hey, Emma, I would also add um, that we uh, are not banning the manufacture of, of military style assault weapons for the military. I mean, they will still be made right. and that's what they're made for, um, but just not for civilian use. Uh, Mike, did you have another question? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this is just kind of, I guess, for the, the lawmakers out there and some of the advocates. Uh, Speaker DeLeo was obviously a huge champion in this area. Um, just kind of checking out what the politics of this is like in, in the House and Senate now that Speaker Mariano is there. Um, he was asked in an interview when he took over about gun control, and he basically just said it, it's now a congressional problem. It's a federal problem. He didn't have any state uh, legislation in mind. So, um, you know, what's it like with the change of speaker? Yep, I'll jump in, um, it's Representative Marjorie Decker. Um, first of all, Leader Mariano then has, was always very supportive of common sense gun ownership laws and prioritizing the safety of Massachusetts residents. Um, this bill was filed this morning. So when you asked him that question and you texted me and I ignored your text. Um, <laughs> he, he was asked in a, in a TV interview, I think. It, it wasn't remember. me doing I, it, yeah. But I remember the text, yes. And we had not filed the bill yet. <clears throat> We filed the bill at 8.30 this morning. Um, and so I imagine just like Speaker DeLeo, who also you'll recall really um, committed to due diligence 
um, Speaker DeLeo, in spite of all the pressure to um, act quickly to support it or to not support it, um, was really committed to due diligence with members and advocates. And I, um, that has been my experience with Speaker um, Mariano, is that he will be committed to due diligence and he has already proven himself to be committed to ensuring um, that we practice, that we, we pass all kinds of laws that ensure the health and the well-being and the safety of Massachusetts residents. Um, okay. Emma, I just, I'm gonna just respond. I see that Emma Plata from the Globe is asking the bill number. It was just filed this morning. So um, at 8.30 this morning, we do not have a bill number yet. As soon as we do, um, we, will, we will send it out. Can I, can I speak as well, uh, Cindy Cream? So uh, there are two bills one filed in the House and one filed in the Senate. So there will be two different, there will be two different bill numbers. Uh, the uh, bill is identical, but they are filed in, in two different places. Um, and in, in response to Dean, uh, I just filed it also this morning. Uh, Senator Spilka has always been very strong uh, advocate for uh, sensible gun legislation. Um, I. Um, worked with my colleagues on the, on the red flag ban and, and Senator Svilka was uh, on board with that. With regard to this bill, you'll have to ask her directly because it was just filed this morning. Yep, absolutely. Uh, okay. um, could, I, could I ask you, Senator Cream, have you checked in with any members of the Springfield delegation in the Senate? I, I have not. It was something I became aware of late. Uh, I'm excited about filing it. Uh, I, that is on my agenda for today. So thank you. You, uh, you're pointing me in the right direction. Uh, and I hope that my colleagues uh, in Springfield uh, will feel um, as uh, Representative Williams that uh, this is a public health issue. Uh, and, and I really feel that, that maybe there was a loophole uh, and that maybe we never really thought about that, uh, that, that we could say that in Massachusetts, you, you're safer uh, because you, uh, you, you know, you're not gonna be able to buy or use an assault weapon. Uh, but that we don't care what happens elsewhere. I think that's the whole point. Um, we all have children, they go to school all over the place. We have family that moves. I myself felt, oh my God, I hadn't even really thought about that. I'm not gonna wear blinders and say, okay, I only care about the individuals here, uh, but I don't care about what happens when my family leaves Massachusetts, uh, if they're gonna, God forbid, be shot uh, with an assault weapon. So I think it's the same thinking and the same thinking process uh, so I, I feel, you know, I don't feel this is, and, and I'm hopeful maybe maybe some of the gun manufacturers themselves will say, you know, maybe that this is good sensible gun legislation. This is certainly not um, anything that's uh, it taking a gun owner's rights away. Um, and so I, I feel I feel good about it. Thank you both. Um, thank you, Senator. I also just uh, we just got the House docket number as we're talking. It was posted, so it's. The House docket number is 4192, and it's now posted on the public site for the House. And, and I will um, post uh, the number in the Senate as soon as I get it. I, I don't have it, so I'm, I'm trying, but I'm not fast enough here, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Cream. And uh, Representative- Zoe. Zoe, this is Sandy Phillips. I'd like to jump in and just answer um, a little further detail on bans of a, assault weapons, bans in, in states. There was a city ban of assault weapons in Boulder and it was taken away by a judge, said, nope, can't do that, preemption. Um, and they had a mass shooting less than two weeks later with an assault weapon. So, we have to do all we can, not just at the state level, but even at the very local le level to ensure that our public and our people, our citizens are safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. And thank you for all your work. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, I just wanna thank everybody for attending today. And thank you so much, Sandy and Lonnie, Manny and Patricia, I know it's not easy to come and share your story. And then also, obviously, thank you, representatives and senator for uh, filing this legislation and um, fighting the good fight for us. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. And thank you. Um, if you would like any additional you know, contact or interviews with any of the folks, 
who have been a part of this, feel free to contact us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.